and welcome to today's program of the Commonwealth Club of California. My name is Gerald Harris, and I'm chair of the club's Technology and Society Forum, and will be your host for today. The focus of the Technology and Society uh, Member Forum is to expose members and attendees to current and emerging developments in science and technology, and in the process generate thinking, ideas about the use and commercialization of technology in creating a better world for all. We welcome your participation in our activities and we'll, and we'll be delighted to receive your ideas. Our contact information can be found at the club's website. On behalf of the Commonwealth Club, I would like to thank the Shan Zuckerberg Initiative for their support for this program and the club's digital communications at this time. And now we'll introduce today's speakers for today's program, Vote by Design for Gen Z. Lisa K. Solomon is a longtime colleague and friend from our shared days working together at Global Business Network, a scenario planning think tank and consulting firm focused on helping leaders creatively plan and manage a multiplicity of futures. Lisa is an author, educator, and designer for good, focused on helping leaders at all ages learn skills required to help them thrive in increasingly complex and uncertain worlds. She is currently designer in resident at the Stanford Hassel Plattner Institute of Design, where she currently teaches courses like Inventing the Future and incubates new programs like Vote by Design, which we will be hearing about this evening. Lisa will be joined by Sam Ball, co-founder and director of Citizen Film, a celebrated Bay Area firm, uh, film, film company that builds storytelling collaborations and coalitions with cultural and educational organizations around the country. Since 2002, Citizen Film has been creating powerful stories that model and inspire civic dialogue and action. Citizen Film's most recent media project, American Creed, was viewed by over 2.6 million times on PBS platforms and in classrooms nationwide. The film centers around a cross-partisan dialogue between Stanford's Condoleezza Rice and David Kennedy and has been used to spark generative conversations about ideas, identity, and citizen power. Welcome, Lisa and Sam. Let me start off with a, an opening question here. Uh, Vote by Design takes a very different approach to educating and engaging first time voters using design and future thinking approaches. Can you share a little bit of background about this project? You know, sort of how did this come to be? Wonderful, Gerald, thank you so much for having us. Uh, Sam and I are thrilled to be sharing some of the impact of the work that we started really in the spring of 2019, if we can all remember far back from there when the presidential election for 2020 was just getting started. And it feels frankly fitting that we are here essentially on the eve of the November election uh, to be working and learning with you and the Commonwealth Club, the nation's oldest and largest public affairs forum. So this feels very right. And we're excited to share the student voices that we have met along this journey that I think for us really give us a sense of hope of what's possible for our future. And as you rightly said, this started at a design firm. So what does a design, excuse me, a design institute, what does a design institute where we learn creative problem solving have to do with elections and with civics? It turns out a lot. And the mm. essential premise that uh, we founded when we created what was a pop-up class. So at the D School, we have an opportunity to try out new content, new pedagogies, new ways of engaging students in uh, getting them more comfortable with their own creative problem-solving skills. 
Um, we were curious, could design a practice that allows us to navigate ambiguity, learn from others, give form to ideas, yeah. experiment and learn along the way, could that help first time voters find agency in a system that frankly was feeling more and more out of their control? Um, the futurists in us look back on 2016 and we asked ourselves, did any of those external forces, do we think they're going to change at all? Do we think, for example, it will be less partisan or less expensive or less noisy or less interference from other kinds of organizations and even foreign entities? And we said no. And at the same time, voters need a way to express their values in their vote. So that was really the idea, the hunch behind it. And I'm absolutely Wonderful. thrilled uh, that we started this, of course, with two of our fellow colleagues, Nancy Murphy, a fellow scenario planner, and Bree Lincoln-Hogan, a neuroscientist. And we thought these are incredibly important disciplines to bring together. So I can tell you about it, but I think it's far better for everyone to actually watch the students go through it. So I'm gonna ask that we get ready to play our first video, which really tees up what this student experience was like to think about voting, not from the standpoint of what candidate do they like, but what do they value and how mm. do they learn from others in asking those kinds of questions. So I'm gonna ask that we tee up the first video to show to our audience. Great, fantastic. Empathy matters to me in a presidential candidate. The more empathetic you are, the more you are able to push and pull with people and truly like understand what's best for everybody as a country. My greatest value is someone who can keep their word and someone who's transparent with their citizens. Well, where I live in the Appalachian Mountains, I have saw politics, you know, either make a very positive impact in our economy or a very negative impact. So I just want, I will, I look for a president who will think of the little people in the equation too, you know. Gotta go with bold slash visionary. Like if I'm going to have someone lead me, I want them to lead me to like a great place, not just like a okay, you know, like I want to go to like this beautiful meadow, not some like outdoor park. And I think being a strong communicator, I would say secondly, is extremely important. And also resilience is very important because as a president or as a leader, not everyone is going to like you. I really liked resilient. Um, I totally understand where you're coming from with like flexible and adaptable, especially in today's day and age, because you have to be able to adapt. <laughs> I also want to see more representation that's like me um, within that executive uh, position because there has never really been a woman or a woman like me, an indigenous woman. It was really cool to actually be with people from like all over the country <laughs> um, and to see like sort of where others are coming from. Um, and it really surprised me how easy it was for us to agree. We all play a role in, in what this country looks like and the shape of it and the vision for it. And I think it's extremely important for every American to recognize that. And I wish that a lot of other people my age could have this experience because I feel like that they would see that if you remove, if you remove candidates and if you remove parties from the situation, we all feel, I feel like as an age group, we have a general consensus. We feel a certain way. We know the things we want in this country. And if we would all actually show up in November, and if we would all actually show up every November after that, it would make a difference. Wow, that was fantastic. I enjoyed watching that. I never get tired of seeing that. I never get tired of hearing these young voices. And I think that video, video really um, demonstrates what we were after. And the shorthand is getting students to think more reflectively, more deliberately, bringing in essentially the Daniel Kahneman work of thinking slow, system two thinking to marry with the work from Doris Kearns Goodwin and other wonderful presidential historians that identify what good looks like. What does leadership look like? 
and um, just couldn't be luckier to partner with Sam Ball and Citizen Film to capture that student experience. Yeah. Sam, yeah. How, how, you can shed some light here. Be great. Yeah, yeah, Gerald. To, to go back to your original question on on background, um, Lisa, w one of her fields as a designer is uh, strategic conversations. How do you design a conversation that um, people can bring their best selves to, and that um, when you walk away from that conversation, you feel like you have a better handle on a complex problem. And um, I read Lisa's book and it clarified a lot of things for me that, you know, we as a documentary company practice all the time. We hadn't thought of it that way, but our expertise is often about how do you create the conditions for a productive conversation between people? How do you build a scene so that people can wrestle with a problem together? And we had a chance to collaborate on a number of different levels. You know, with, I'm, I'm always looking for, how do you do it to tell the best story? And Lisa's always looking at it, well, how do you do that to produce the best outcome? And of course, you know, we overlap in these ways as well. Um, and because we only have so much time, we won't show you all of the different footage uh, that we have, but we tried to set up conversations in places that are very different from one another. Um, and one of the conditions in this country is that our education system, so we were really focused on first time voters on the young side of the spectrum, people who are turning 18, have just turned 18, maybe they're 19. So we partnered with education organizations, colleges, et cetera, and one of the things that happens at all of these levels and particularly at the high school levels in, in this country is that we are very compartmentalized as a society, very segregated in many places. And we worked these conversations into different settings. And we found, for example, that in a deep red district in rural Montana that voted 94% for Trump in 2016, when we talked to people there who really know their students um, and we set up a conversation in a classroom uh, with the National Writing Project in Montana and a great educator named Casey Olson. One of the things he said is, look, students know what their parents are telling them. They know what they're watching on TV, but they don't necessarily have the tools to work from their own experience and think about their own agency as voters. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really resonated for him is the way that the design process starts in this case with a job description. What does the Constitution of the United States say the president's job is? And in a community where the Constitution has a sacredness to it, they were able to start from that job description and work backwards to the kinds of leadership they want for themselves, not for their parents, uh, but for themselves. And that was a very powerful conversation. And I'm only gonna tell you two anecdotes, but there were many others in a, in a community in Memphis where the population is 100% African-American. And I should say the population in that rural Montana community, at least in that classroom was not 100% white, but close to it. Uh, in this community that is 100% African-American in Memphis, the design process led them to start talking about what they see in their surroundings. Why is their city designed the way it is? And why does government not seem to serve people equally within their city? And they started to think about that as a design problem and as a leadership problem that um, they could look at as designers. Well, how can we design things so that they are better for us? And after we tried a number of these experiences and what we found universally is that the conversations were productive. Students were able to bring their full selves to the conversation, imagine themselves as voters, imagine themselves in the role of the president. And we thought, well, what would happen because we have this silver lining of this moment where most of the country, the vast majority of the country in high school senior classrooms is virtual. There's really no technological barrier to bringing students together. So by partnering with the Writing Project, National Writing Project, Make the Challenge, and other organizations, we started experimenting with bringing classrooms, creating our own community from different classrooms around the country. And something kind of magical happened. We were nervous about it because we're bringing 
kids in who self-identified as conservatives. We had different class backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds. I mean, really, you know, not perfect diversity within a cohort of 12 people, obviously, because you can't do that, but a pretty wide range. And we found that students brought their full selves to the conversation. They collaborated on problem solving. They really wrestled with their values as individuals and as a community and learned to think or, or at least started to think about the United States uh, and the potential for the United States to be a community and what that would entail in terms of the kind of leadership that would make that possible. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. of course, we're not you know, here to solve every problem that's impossible and the students can't do that themselves. But the magical thing that happened is that all of a sudden in the Zoom chat, they started trading their social media handles and cell phone numbers, and they really wanted to continue talking to one another. And in our interviews with students after the fact, we heard things like, you know, I'd really like to get to know that kid in Utah because I've never met anybody like that. I'd really like to get to know that kid in Atlanta. I've never met anybody like that. And there's a tremendous sense of hope that when you get right down to students thinking about how democracy works and then from there, or how democracy can work, and then from there designing what their own vision of leadership looks like, it is an immensely hopeful experience. Great, great. So uh, this session seems to be about igniting what you call uh, Gen Z for voter agency. Um, we're less than three weeks out from the election. So what is this voter agency? Uh, what have you learned about you know, processing and engaging? You touched on some of that, these voters, but can you tell us you know, about your experience and, and, and creating this agency that you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, I think it really picks up on a lot of what Sam was just sharing there, where students see themselves as active participants where the election or other decisions are not happening to them, but they can actually be proactive in either asking different questions or understanding what it is that they need to be focused on in order to participate. And we're at an incredible moment of participation and it's really, really inspiring to see. One of the things that design offers is a practice of asking a different question, of reframing. And if you take a look at any research, you will often see that young voters are apathetic. They don't come to the polls, right? They don't, and, and so it insinuates that they don't care. I think Sam and I would say that is 100% not true. Young voters care a lot, but they are confused. They haven't had the practice to think about themselves as voters, which it turns out is a very different mindset than thinking of themselves as students. We worked with one fabulous teacher outside of Atlanta who had this epiphany. He said, you know, it occurs to me that we spend 40 hours helping 16 year olds learn how to operate this machinery called an automobile. We spend zero hours helping our 18 year olds learn how to participate in arguably a far more complex machinery called democracy. It's really important that we spend time in our civics classes, our history classes, our government classes to understand how our government works. That is foundational work. And we have to activate it. We have to make it relevant and resonant. And so what Sam was describing, this process of coming in, frankly, feeling like an imposter, I can't begin to tell you how many young first time voters that know they need to vote because everybody's telling them they need to vote. And the closer we get to the election, the more famous the people are that are telling them to vote, you name it, and they're telling them to vote. But inside they're thinking, am I qualified? Do I know enough? I wasn't in the civics club. I'm not part of the political action group. I'm not sure I'm really capable of it. And what's been so exciting is to see just by reframing, just by starting with where they are, just by, as Sam said, defining what is the job of the president as stated in the original job description of the US Constitution, and to help them see that as voters, they're really hiring for that job, that they're a hiring manager. All of a sudden, they're, they're standing up straighter. Wait a minute, I have points of view on leadership. I could start to think about that. So we're infusing their sense of growth, of being able to voice their opinions, giving them some foundational knowledge that they can ground themselves on, and then enter into conversation with others. And from this, even in these short interventions, it's just been extraordinary what we've heard. 
when we hear them say, wow, I used to think I wasn't qualified and now I think I know how to go forward. Or as Sam said, I used to think what my parents thought, but now I think for myself. So it's been really, really exciting to, to give them that gift of not only participating in November, but really a lifetime of participation. And it sounds like you helped them build really some self-confidence in, in themselves and their own ability to think. Absolutely. And we are also giving them different ways to gather evidence to make sure that they're not just at the whim of the latest social media meme or the latest campaign ad. I mean, we're moving into a faster and faster environment where we don't have time to slow down and think. So if we're not really creating that foundation of critical thinking, then they are going to be at the mercy of the loudest voice, which we know very, very loud, right? And backed <laughs> by algorithms, They're backed by outside forces. So this is really a chance yeah. for them to develop their own personal perspective. Yeah, great. Uh, the, the, other, the other problem, you know, we're finding, and I mean, we're not the first observers of this, is there's just a level of frustration with, does my vote matter? Are these mm. choices worth choosing between? And there's a really um, exciting component of some of the work we've been doing, just to ask first-time voters or potential first-time voters to imagine themselves as the president of the United States faced with a very plausible crisis. And they collaborate with one another and they switch off. One person plays the president, the other person plays the press secretary. There could be up to four roles, six roles sometimes, uh, cabinet advisors, and depending on the crisis, there are different roles. And by looking at these very plausible crises, um, similar ones which have happened even over the course of our uh, working on this project, they get to um, look at what leadership can do in response to crisis. You know, once they understand the powers of the executive branch, they are given a real life plausible, real life in the sense of plausible future crisis to respond to. And that really sharpens this idea of agency. Like maybe I don't like my choices, but I can make decisions about how, if I choose not to vote, that might impact the outcome of a tragedy, for example, for a very great number of people. It becomes a lot more tangible. So in addition to gaining a sense of what presidential powers are, they're also getting a sense of the importance of having a say in who the leader is and in imagining something about, you know, being able to um, ideate, to, to, to visualize what leadership should look like if that leadership is going to serve them. Mm -hmm. I think Great. we actually have a video that shows these students working through a, one of these potential crises. And I will say, just echoing what Sam said, when we wrote these, over a year and a half ago, we created five plausible scenarios. We could have never imagined just how fast the future would come at us. And I could tell you with a 100% certainty that the students that have spent time essentially rehearsing the future and thinking about what they want in a leader to respond, bringing some of those attributes that you heard them talk about before. How would an empathetic leader respond? How would a decisive leader respond? How would a strong communicator need to show up in order to communicate the plan of action? So it's really exciting to see how much they learn from immersing themselves into the future. So um, again, I wanna tee up the next video that we have for you, um, which really shows these students working through at the time an inkling of a possible future. And, and you know, we'll see on the other side uh, where we are today on, on that future. So um, if we could roll the second video. Part of the vote by design Part process is to immerse potential future voters into potential future scenarios. I think it's really exciting for all students to learn scenario planning and design thinking, not just when they're solving a novel problem, but even how they handle uncertainty in their everyday. According to official intel, 2020 elections had indeed been hacked. The president has called a press conference to inform the nation of the steps uh, he slash she has decided to take. 
I feel like there needs to be some sort of like committee created on like the bureaucratic level to investigate. And I also think like if we're talking about equity, like it's important that like this committee really tries to find out who exactly was targeted. I think the biggest thing to say is promising to fix it fix the problem and saying that this won't happen again. I also feel like you to take accountability. Yeah. And you need to apologize. That needs to be the biggest thing, especially if we're going to be empathetic. We want to call out Congress and be like, hey, yo, you're not helping the situation because you're all getting, you know, stashed with these with money from Google, Amazon, Apple. Yeah, you know. I kind of think, I definitely think we, we would need to like call out like Google, Apple. Would we want to state that it was done by Russian and Chinese hackers and do we go after them or do we not? I think right. we need to like know like I don't want us to like <laughs> accuse people without knowing. Yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to start right the start of it. I'm just trying to figure out if we have enough time to kind of get all that info in. Uh two minutes. Yeah. Two minutes. Um we have a hacking of an election that requires attention. Madam President my fellow Americans, on the 11th day of October 2021, I was given reliable information that the 2020 elections were indeed hacked. Currently, sources point towards Russian and Chinese influence, though this is not 100% confirmed. The democratic process of the American election system was breached and the trust of the American people has been broken. While I understand that the voters were, are outraged, I assure you that we will get to the bottom of this. My first action will be to open an independent investigation into this issue and bring the perpetrators to justice. I will also strengthen the Federal Election Commission to help strengthen this voting system so that this will never be repeated. If it is found that I had won this election solely due to outside hacking, I will then step down as this system was put in place by our founding fathers to serve the people, not its leaders. Thank you. Wow. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that was amazing. Um, let, let me ask you another question, because I know down at, at, at Stanford, you know, you guys are, you know, some of the smartest people in the world down there. Um, but you know, this is a pretty partisan, you know, election cycle we're about to go into. Um, can you talk a little bit more, you know, I know some of these things behind design, thinking about the principles like of neuroscience, you know, things about bias, uh, you know, learning science, you know, enter your program, because I know this is a little bit more complex than what it may appear on the surface. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Gerald, and you're right. I am so lucky to work with some of the colleagues uh, that I get to work with every day and learn from every day, very similar to our days at GVN, where we would go in and say, what question are we going to ask today? How are we going to come together to solve it? Um, mm -hmm. One thing about design that is important is that you start with some principles and you work around that. And one principle that we were uncompromising was that it would be nonpartisan. Uh, that was something unwavering. And as Sam said earlier, we kept testing this in all kinds of environments, including in deep red rural areas, um, in purple suburbs, in uh, bluer areas. And because it was so deliberately built on starting with where the student was when they walked in, and all along the way, we kept saying, listen, there are no right or wrong answers. And to be sure, this is not about trying to convince somebody else that the candidate or party that you're a part of is the right one. That doesn't help us learn. We are here to learn. And we're here, we are here to learn from each other. Um, and even when we created uh, tremendous amounts of digital materials that would allow educators and librarians, community leaders, to bring this into their own communities. And we spent a lot of time, particularly after COVID hit, to take what was an in-person workshop and translate that digitally. We were very, very focused on the framing. And we have a very detailed facilitator guide, for example, that says, frame this, ask this, in part because we wanted everybody to feel safe. I mean, listen, remote learning is hard to begin with. To do it on topics that we know can be triggering, can be difficult, um, that it's easy to back away from that. And we're spending a lot of time working with our partners like iCivics, Mikva Challenge and others to say, look, this is exactly what we need to be leaning into right now. We have to be having these conversations, but we have to be doing them 
in a safe way. We have to be doing them that allows all students to bring their full selves forward. Um, I was delighted when early on, when we started building out some of our professional development materials for educators, I had a public school teacher down in Southern California who emailed me the day after our very, very first uh, public workshop for educators. And she said, I'm in, I'm ready, give it to me. I was like, oh, okay, here you go. And of course we know we learned by doing. So I gave it to her. And she came back and she just loved it. And she said things like, this allowed some of my quieter students to participate. This mm. allowed me to do what I love to do, which is to support the growth of my students on the most important topics that they're gonna need to learn about. And in fact, I was thrilled when she told me that she was gonna start day one of her fall semester with Vote by Design, not only because it was so relevant from a content standpoint, but because she wanted to infuse norms of how the students would learn from and with each other. She really wanted to make sure that they were comfortable building that agency that we talked about and wanted to demonstrate that that's how her entire class would go. So um, it's really, really important to us. And one of the things that we've learned, as Sam said earlier, is that when you take out some of that worry or you name it, it allows students to express for themselves ideas that they never thought that they could have. Um, and I'll just say one more thing about the bias. As I mentioned earlier, we were really, really lucky to have a neuroscientist helping us think about how to actually scaffold this experience. And so we were very deliberate. And first of all, starting with just where are you? What do you think the job of the president is? Do you, do you have clarity? Yes or no? Just very, very light. Building in their ability to kind of add layer and detail. So let's define what is the president's job? What are the leadership qualities? Getting them into that reflective learning. And then we actually expose them to debates, debate clips, past debate clips. And again, we are very careful to have two from the Republican of 2016, two from the Democrat of 2020, and just ask them with their criteria in mind to listen. Listen differently. What do you notice? What are you paying attention to? And again, for first time voters listening to presidential debates, well, typically, anyway, it sounds a little bit like that Charlie Brown, you know, adult, oh. you know, <laughs> wah, 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 you know, there's no guidance, there's no, there's no parsing out, but here they had a map, we gave them a worksheet, we gave them a leadership scorecard. So we're giving them the tools to be like, wait, no, I can learn, I can listen, I can have a conversation with someone that I'm listening with. So it was really, really exciting to have them surface some of their biases. Um, and, and from that, for example, we would have students say, wow, you know, I never thought that I would find a Republican candidate appealing, but I really appreciated the way that this leader showed up. I really appreciated how much they emphasized having a servant's heart. This is back in, in 2016 and, and looking at those debates. And so we just, again, are just infusing their confidence that they can be active listeners, that they can parse out um, what is true to them. And if they're not finding what they need, that they have the ability to go and gather evidence. And that's been really exciting. This sounds like exactly what Citizen Film was designed to do. Is that right, Sam? <laughs> yeah, I, I keep coming back to, you know, the one of the main ways we tell documentary stories is collaborate with people to um, uh, be co-designers of conversations and you know, scenes that um, they feel comfortable in. And often we're doing that with people who um, are comfortable with one another. And, and in this project, that's an example where the educator will come into a virtual classroom and they've already built that classroom community. And um, when you're working with a great educator, that's such a big part of the job. And uh, when we're doing these other things with our education partners, inviting first time voters, college students or high school students, or just people who are 19 and, and out there in the workforce or not to come together, that's not an inherently comfortable situation. There's some risk because they're going in knowing that um, there are people in that room who don't think like them, who don't look like them, who haven't had their experiences. And that can be a much more fraught situation. And the, the power of working with Lisa is um, that by trying this a couple of times, we were able to develop a process where it's pretty seamless. If, if two educators um, from our great partner, the National Writing Project, are coming from really different communities, they're scaffolding there so that 
um, people can enter into conversation with one another first safely and secondly, bring their full selves to that conversation so that there's just this amazing, you know, you talk about neuroscience, there's an amazing thing that happens when you ask people to slow down and solve a problem together. And slowing down is still very fast because this is a, a one hour class um, situation, at least when you're working with high school seniors, but there's this amazing magic black box after this um, ladder of ideas has happened where we say, okay, congratulations, you've learned a lot and now you get to be the president and you're gonna take turns and you're gonna solve problems together. And um, maybe do we have time to roll another clip of some problem solving? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. In that case, let's roll video number three. And um, you know, I, I think this is a great example of students having to um, first get to know one another, reckon with the fact that they don't hold the same beliefs and then respond to a crisis together. So let's roll video three, if we could. Uh, last Saturday, the third category five hurricane in the last three years hit Florida. The president has called a press conference to inform the nation of the steps he or she would like to take. Should we declare a state of emergency? Because like, I'm yes. trying to think of like what like specific executive powers like we can actually use. Yes, yes, okay. I, I would agree with that. I would ask FEMA to head out to the locations where the storm has had the most impact. Thousands are reported injured or displaced. Like, what, what are we doing to kind of combat that? I guess it almost goes back to sort of having to communicate that empathetic side of the president and sort of showing your support and that you're standing with those families. I'm just not exactly sure how to put that into words. So Jonathan's president and Tejan is the press secretary, right? So um, I started on the um, press briefing. Um, if you guys want to add a little on to it. My fellow Americans, on October 21st, 2020, America faced great environmental turmoil. Officials estimate a death toll of over 1,000 lives lost. While thousands are still displaced and missing, air hearts and prayers go out to families and individuals impacted. Let us hold a moment of silence for the people impacted by this great disaster. Thank you. Air administration is working around the clock to combat this ongoing environmental crisis. For now, I'm declaring a state of emergency so we can solve this issue as quickly as possible and ensure the safety of our communities. We've spoken to state, tribal, and local leaders about how to effectively solve these environmental issues. We're calling on the National Guard, business leaders, economic leaders, and FEMA to urgently help with providing resources for communities impacted. Though times may seem uncertain, just know that we are with you and we will reach you as soon as possible. Thank you. Mm, wow. Yeah. You know, I, I think this, this, this is actually about values and the values that people share. I know you guys want to talk a little bit about that as well. Well, I think that this process allows them to give form to those ideas. What, what do they value going in? And then when they learn from others, what do they value? One of my favorite parts about this program is when we just ask the question, thinking ahead, what, what are your hopes for this country? Um, and what are your hopes for this country as relates to the leader and the choices that this leader has made? And from the very beginning, when you just frame it that way, and we start to see patterns where it doesn't matter what their political background is, these students will say things like, I'd like to see a country that's unified. I'd like to see a company, a country that's repaired. I'd like to see a country that cares about others and particularly those that uh, don't get enough attention it allows them a starting place from which they can start to unpack some of their different values that they might hold. And they start to realize maybe they're not so different after all. I mean, one of the things that we were really passionate about in bringing this program to so many educators through our incredible partners is to try to debunk this narrative that feels like we are headed towards, which is that we are destined to be divided and partisan for years to come. That's a heartbreaking narrative to feel like that you can't change. 
when we talk to these students and they come out and they say, wow, now I understand how I can participate. Now I understand how I can learn from others. Now I understand how to translate these feelings that I have about this issue that I'm so passionate about into action that can have a long-term impact. That's powerful. Great, great. Um, Sam, do you have anything you wanna to add to that? Yeah, that, that was well said. And I, I um, yeah, maybe just a little context for the video that you just saw, that setting. Uh, Jonathan, who got to play the president in that last clip, is from a very rural community in Appalachia. He uh, you know, was very upfront in the conversation that he identifies as conservative, that economic issues are very important to him and he sees the solution to those economic issues as being um, minimal government interference. And um, he was speaking to a young woman who is Native American and has very different feelings about the government's role, for example, in protecting the environment. And, you know, I don't, we're not Pollyannish. We're not saying that those two people are um, going to necessarily vote the same way or all, you know, be kumbaya. That's, that's really not the point. The point is that they were really able to have a substantive conversation with one another um, what you just saw was a role-playing exercise that's about 20 minutes of this, but the, the conversation runs far deeper and come away with a better understanding of their positions. So, okay, I get you. Your, your father was a coal miner and, and, or, and he can't work in the mine anymore. And your grandfather was a coal miner and your great-grandfather was a coal miner. I get that. I, I get how that shapes your views. And on the other hand, um, uh, and that's Roxy to Jonathan. And on the other hand, Jonathan being able to say, you know, I get that coal isn't forever. I just don't think leadership is thinking about us. And he cited a, a leadership thing that happened in his state where he's from Virginia, right on the West Virginia, I believe, Kentucky and Tennessee border. And the governor gave a speech after an actual hurricane, that, you know, the very same kind of crisis he was going to give, saying, We've coordinated with our neighbors. And when he said our neighbors, he said Maryland and North Carolina. And he said, well, he's not even thinking about us. <laughs> and so he had that in his mind as he approached this exercise. And you know, there's something that kind of tickled me that he hadn't thought about working into his speech. You know, we just showed an excerpt to it. And Roxy said, hey, you know, you've got to say that you've got to talk to tribal leaders before you do anything. He's like, oh. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of an awakening for him. And she had an awakening too of just understanding the context. And I also think in a weird way, like that makes for a better democracy that you can then negotiate. You can appeal to people from your place of values if you understand why they feel the way they do. It's a much better communication. And I think that's something that is you know, sorely lacking in this country. So I there are many things that make me hopeful about this project. And one of them is just the idea that this um, horrible moment that we're in has created a silver lining where people can come together virtually and have substantive conversations. And we found with our great education partners that it's actually not that hard to bring high school seniors together to have these types of conversations. And this could be done on a massive scale. So we're really looking forward to that as we think about yeah. next phases of our collaboration. Yeah, and, uh, now you, you had a did you, did you want to, you had a short clip you wanted to share on that? Did you still want to use that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd love to. Okay. Take it. And, yeah. And yeah. Go ahead. Know, yeah. What, what, it, what it really talks about is you know giving these students the ability and these first time voters to look more holistically about about who it is that they're voting for, in part because they're starting to learn from others. And a lot of times, and we've certainly learned this to be true. First time voters go in thinking on a policy that they care about. And so we know this, we would ask an opening question, do you vote primarily based on policy or on the leadership qualities of the person? And it's not surprising. We were seeing a tremendous activism and uh, activity from our young voters around issues that they care about, the environment, Black Lives Matter. 
And for these, for them, this is very eye-opening in these conversations to learn that the leadership qualities uh, matter uh, as much. And so we have a fabulous clip of um, a young woman named Clara, who you know really is very open about how this experience changed her understanding of how to look for different things when voting. So if I could ask us to tee up video four, and we'll get a sense of what Clara had to say. Since we went through that process of really trying to figure out what we prioritized as a president and what we want to see, it made me separate um, kind of like the person from their words. And really, I wasn't thinking like, oh, I'm watching a Republican debate or a Democratic debate. I was thinking, what is this person using their one minute to offer me and how are they convincing me of their um, abilities as a leader and as a person in general to be president. Yeah. And um, did you have one more of another person? I think you, you had another one to, 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 to match with her, I think. Yeah. So, so Sam was talking a little bit about Roxy. Sam, do you want to tee this one up? Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at the time and I know we're on a clip. So maybe no, we, no, should... we have time. Oh. We have plenty of time. Oh, we do? Okay. Well, we yeah. have two more short clips and, yep. and maybe um, let's play Roxy first. It's a 30-second mm -hmm. clip. It's video five for Arnav back there. Let's roll it. I used to think that I was an active listener, but now I know that I need to be more of an active listener, especially when I'm listening to debates and when I'm listening to presidential candidates and even the president speak. I used to think that it was extremely challenging or even impossible to speak with other people with different ideological beliefs. But now I think it's a lot easier once we're in a setting where um, we can put our biases aside and talk about values. Great, great. I want to say, Gerald, can I just say, yeah. I mean, Roxy spent maybe a couple hours with us. I mean, that is such an extraordinary mind shift that can happen in this time. And again, I really want to speak to the power of design, the power of experiences, the power of creating the conditions of bringing people together. And um, I, I just, as an educator, just never get tired of seeing that kind of transformation because that will you know, really influence how she approaches all elections going forward and hopefully even conversations going forward. Um, going back to that clip of Jonathan presenting in the face of the natural disaster, one of my favorite parts is everybody leaning in and cheering, <laughs> cheering him on. Uh, they didn't know Jonathan two hours before that. And here they are really, really rooting for him. And as Sam mentioned, we know that these students are still in contact with each other. Uh, we know that we have better ideas when we get diverse perspectives to help us think through those ideas. Um, mm -hmm. So there's so much that we can uh, carry forward from this approach. Um, you know, and the last thing I'll say about that, and, and you heard Roxy say, uh, and Clara say, I used to think dot, 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 and now I think, this is how we end all of our classes at the D school, because it can be hard to quantify that kind of mind shift change, that mindset difference from one to another. But we know as educators, that's very much what we are after. We're after these students seeing themselves as capable, as ready to engage with the complexity that is our world. So really, really exciting to be able to share that. There's nothing like a great aha experience. Huh? <laughs> that's felt, yeah. right? That's not intellectual, right? Yeah. I don't, there's no amount of memorization that it would have gotten these students to that place. It's yeah. because we asked them to say, you are the president. You have to pull on others. You have to be in response to this moment. And again, a huge hats off to uh, my colleagues, Nancy and Bree, Emily Shepard and others that helped us create at the time five different scenarios um, that frankly have all come true. I mean, I don't mean to be uh, crazy clairvoyant here, but 18 months ago, one of the scenarios we had was a pandemic of a flu-like virus that originated in China and shut down the world economy. We could have never imagined COVID-19. And yet, Cheryl, because of our scenario planning background, we had seeds to pull on. So I can tell you as a byproduct that these students are not gonna be thinking about their future in the same way. They're now sensitized and social and socialized to think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Listen, we, we got about another good, a good 10 minutes. I'm glad you mentioned the, uh, you know, the COVID because boy, that's, uh, 
Uh, that's a real doozy, I think, for everybody. And uh, but it sounds like you you learned some things, you know, through that experience. So I don't know if you and Sam want to say more about it or, or no. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think um, you know we're in a moment, and for many of the students we brought together, a, a really challenging moment economically in terms of people they've lost, um, and we can't minimize that. And, and that's on top of everything else going on. Um, one of the things I'm really excited about in working with Lisa, who's an educator as well as a designer, and all of our all of the education organizations that have worked with us to share clips, integrate clips into workshops, um, create conditions so that large networks of educators can participate and bring their high school seniors in and college students in and uh, Lisa can talk a little bit about more about that in a moment. I, I'm really excited about what this moment has um, forced many of us to do with the use of technology, since that's your field, Gerald. Um, there's an amazing thing we can do. We can build community with people who live in different parts of the country, and we can design strategic conversations that emphasize that um, as our friend Eric Liu, uh, great civic thinker, likes to say, we're all better off when we're all better off. And there mm -hmm. are still certain values that most Americans agree are important, that we should all be able to vote. Um, yeah. And, for example, at, at minimum. And um, when you bring people together at an age where their ideas haven't quite hardened, they're much more receptive to talking to one another. And I really think there's great hope for our democracy when you combine the wonderful um, reach of the kinds of civic organizations we have in the United States, the kind of educational organizations we have in the United States with the simplicity of a technology that, you know, we've all come to hate it, but, you know, thank God. And I, I'm not going to plug any particular company, but thank God for these technologies that enable us to have conversations with one another online. And this pandemic will end, um, but that technology will get better. And yeah. we will continue to be able to um, work with civic organizations, with education organizations to um, facilitate people who live in this country talking to one another about the way they choose their elected leaders, the kinds of elected leaders we choose, the role of those elected leaders, and going forward, how we hold elected leaders accountable for the things that as citizens, and citizens are designers of democracy when democracy is working, the kinds of things that are important to the functioning of democracy. I think there is a tremendous opportunity here that's untapped or right. under tapped that we, we've hit this vein that we want to keep pushing. So it sounds like you guys are not only doing the, the teaching and the facilitating, but you're, you're learning stuff yourself. You're growing yourself through, through this process as well. So, you know, anything you just want to talk about, about your own learning, you know, as you're doing that. Oh my gosh, Gerald, every day, every day we are learning. something. <laughs> every day we are humble. Um, and it has been extraordinary. And I just really want to emphasize, uh, we are, we are, uh, sharing this uh, effort that has really become a coalition. I mean, an ecosystem of so many that have come on board to say it matters. It matters that we teach this and it matters that we teach this in a way that our first time voters can understand. Um, and, and so that has just been extraordinary I and mean, a tremendous learning for me, right? How open people are to partnering and to saying, because we had so much clarity around things like this is nonpartisan, this is student centered, this is not about driving home any agenda, but really about unleashing the potential of students. How many people said, great, how can I be a part of this? So one tremendous learning for me, you know, is the partnership building and Sam and Citizen Film, um, they, they've really done this so beautifully. They see everything through the lens of coalitions and, and partnerships. Um, and so for us to get a chance to work with the American Library Association to bring this to their public communities, the chance to work with incredible education networks and networks of schools like XQ Schools um, and the National Writing Project that Sam mentioned earlier. Um, I even had the opportunity to work with the Chicago Bulls, which was extraordinary. <laughs> I mean, if you said to me when we started this, 
hey, you know, Lisa, I think you're going to be bringing Vote by Design to the Chicago Bulls. Um, but the tremendous civic leadership that that organization and so many within the NBA professional yeah. sports are saying, this is our job. This is all of our jobs to make sure we are supporting our communities in ways that they need to be supported. Yeah. And yeah. I'll just end this with, you know, an incredibly inspiring partnership that we've been that we've begun with the National Association of Basketball Coaches. A thousand uh, college coaches took a pledge to help their student athletes not only register, but also learn about the process. So imagine these student athletes have the opportunity to learn with probably the adult figure in their life that matters most to them, who is saying to them, this matters, this is how you show up. Um, and it's just been extraordinary to work with coaches like Coach Eric Reveno down at Georgia Tech, who is really making this part of his mission to say, this is our job, we're all gonna learn together. Um, and so that gives me just huge hope that civics does not need to be confined nor should it be confined to a classroom. It is all of our jobs to be able to foster these conversations, to support young people feeling like they have skin in the game. In fact, when we're voting, we're voting for them because we're making a bet on the future. So how great to be in dialogue with them and how great to have so many partners that want to join us on this. Great, great. This is Sam, anything else? I got one yeah, question I mean, it, it, from uh, yeah, absolutely. From if I, may, I want to share. Go ahead. Yeah, if I, if I may, I, I wanted to say that you know, the, the simplicity of these facilitated conversations is such that, um, yes, you know, educators, high school teachers are already experts in how to build community. But out of the box at votebydesign.org, there are resources they can use, whether they want to do something with their own class or they want to um, create a partnership with another class. Lisa mentioned college basketball coaches. It's right out of the box. They can facilitate a conversation with their athletes. And it, it really is, um, you know, adults can, uh, of our age could take it, um, but it's really particularly well suited for people in that kind of formative years who are making the transition to being citizens in the full sense of the word, not necessarily in terms of documentation, in terms of that, you know, owning your role in a democracy, that age group 17 to 21 um, for everybody out there who works with people in that age group, this is a great out-of-the-box resource at votebydesign.org. Mm -hmm. Let me just there squeeze are... in a question from the audience before we finish oh, off. I would um, love to, uh, for us to play one more video. Though, oh, sure. Oh, no, please do. Please do. Oh, sorry, Gerald. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, that. please do. No. So sad if Jonathan did not get a, a chance to share what this process has been with him because it's right in that heart of what Sam was talking about. So this is, I think, our final video, video six, and it'd be great to show it. It was it was a learning experience. Before this workshop, before this process took place, I thought that it was the president's job to almost, I hate to say it, but to almost do the bare minimum in order to keep as many people as possible happy. But now I think that the role of the president goes deeper than that. I think that it should be a visionary, a bold, charismatic, you know, curious leader, that the president's qualities should be more reflective of the 21st century and that they should be more flexible and versatile and willing to bend but not break and just be a leader of all the people. It's wonderful to see the, the growth and the, the thought process of that, of that young man. It's, it's, it's impressive, super impressive. Um, the question that sort of came from our audience here is that, uh, and, and maybe you know about this, uh, Lisa, but apparently back in 1979, uh, Stanford took a bill to Congress that asked that people from 17, 18, 19 years old uh, be involved in civic you know, activities, uh, volunteering local service, uh, but it'd be part of the sort of the national service program. And I think one of the candidates talks about that. So I guess people have thought about this uh, before. <laughs> Listen, Gerald, what a, what a great question. I didn't actually know about that specific instance, but you know, if you, you talked about COVID, COVID has disrupted everything. It has disrupted everything and it has shed a light, uh, really a, a harsh light on so many inequities that we have to take action on. 
including, including making sure that we allow everyone to participate in our democracy, that that is more vital than ever. Um, and, and that uh, comment brings up a, a very inspiring concept that I learned from Tufts University. They have a center for civic engagement where they talk about this notion of growing voters, that we need to be thinking about these conversations well before they hit 18, that we're not just mobilizing activity for an episodic event. We are fostering confidence and we are fostering a set of values that says, no, it is my job, it is my responsibility, and I am capable of participating. So I appreciate that that was really about, I think a, a few things that I heard. One is starting earlier than just 18 and right before, you know, I can't stand it when people say, oh, you know, the election starts at Labor Day. No, it doesn't, it is ongoing. <laughs> and by the way, presidential years are of course not the only years we vote, right? That this is much, much bigger than that. And we need to see civics as a holistic discipline that really allows us to understand um, things like where we get our information from and media literacy and how to make sure that we're understanding the source material and how to tap into conversations in our families, in our communities. So um, I, I'm just really, really hopeful that all of this activity around this event that's happening in a couple of weeks uh, will continue to foster better conversations, better dialogue, more asking of the questions of what else, how else can we get involved? Well, listen, I think it's fantastic that uh you know, the work that you're doing uh, in terms of just enhancing our commitment to democracy, enhancing our, you know, participation of all people, you know, of all, across all different, different backgrounds. So let me uh, sort of bring our program to a close. I want to thank Lisa and Sam uh, for their insights and this very useful program. I'm pretty sure people will get a lot out of, of listening to what you have to say and, 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 and taking up the, the thing that you're offering. So in conclusion, I'd like again to thank the Shan, uh, Shan Zuckerberg Initiative for their support of the Commonwealth Club, particularly in our digital programming. At this time, this meeting of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Gerald. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Commonwealth Club.